All right. Welcome, everyone. This is David Morgan from themorganreport.com, and this is day two of the Metals Investors Forum. Thank you once again for everyone that hosts the Metals Investors Forum, all participants, most of my friends, and all attending. It is always an honor to be able to speak to this group. Uh, obviously, I've got a presentation. Here's the disclaimer. Uh, you can believe or not believe anything I say. There are some poor looking statements. It's the best of my ability, and I'm giving you my straight opinion. I'm going to focus today mostly on this lecture about the miners, and I want to focus on how to maximize profits. And I'm going to go through the macro picture, and then I'm going to get specific to what I see in our near-term future. So when you maximize profits, what you really want to do is, is mitigate your risk and maximize your return. So it's a risk-reward profile, and many, especially new investors in the resource sectors, do not know how to understand, really understand how to mitigate the risk. And there's a reason for that, and I'll get into that in a moment. <clears throat> so first of all, let's talk about the beginning of this cycle. And the beginning of this cycle started off extremely well in the early 2000s. Gold was uh, about 252 US dollars in the year 2000, and we had an extremely strong gold market for 11 straight years. Gold went up year over year, 11 years in a row. And we saw gold go from 252 to roughly 2000, peaked out in September of 2011. And now we're getting into the point where we're breaching that old high, or maybe we have breached it a couple of times, but it's still having a little trouble getting through the $2,000 level and sustaining it. So going on to the discovery cycle, I'm gonna show you two graphs. This is also sometimes called the Lausanne curve. And what we see here is the model of a classic mining company. Now, this is from discovery to production. I think I'm going to do this in reverse. So I'm going to come back to this slide. So I'm going to go to this one first. This is the Lasson curve. This is where the risk-reward profile varies depending on where we are in the macro picture. Let me explain. First of all, let's look at this graph together. So these are speculative investments. Going to the right is time and going up the Y scale, Y axis, we've got price, we've got reward. So we're in a speculative investment down here. We bought into this XYZ mining. It's a it's a an explorer. It's on the Vancouver Stock Exchange. We met the management. We like the company. They got a great story and we're in. So here we are. Now this company has a material change. It makes a discovery. See this word discovery. Upon the discovery, the stock price goes from this level, which there's no real numbers because it's the idea, not the numbers. But we'll just call it from you know 10 cents up to 10 bucks or 100 bucks or a buck. I don't care. Make it a 10 bag or make it a 100 bag or make it a 1,000 bag. The idea is you get a huge gain upon the discovery. This is where you want to sell. You want to sell at the exact top. No one can. It's an immature approach. But you want to sell in the strength. And this happens very, very rarely. It's about one in 4,000. But during certain aspects of a major bull market, like we started in the year 2000, there are times when almost any company that is an explorer will make that kind of a move. And that took place roughly between 2000 and say 2004 or five. You can check, check with anyone at this conference, check with the people that you all respect, check with Eric Coffin, check with any of the other speakers. <clears throat> and they'll tell you the truth that you didn't have to have much more than a great story in the early 2000s to have a, a stock that would go almost all of them, not all of them perform. You go past 2005 and six, you'll see that many of those companies are off the board. They don't even exist anymore. So you want to be very careful on discovery situations. The way we do it at the Morgan Report is once the discovery is made and it's going up this parabolic move, I evaluate what the discovery means in terms of stock price. What would be the value per share? So if it's down here, I might go ahead and put out an alert and say you can buy it, buy it with caution and expect it to double from here and get out. So this is an actual discovery. You see this red line. If the, if the discovery turns out to be false, the stock basically goes back down to nothing. But assuming there is a discovery, it overshoots, and then it backs and fills, and it comes down quite a bit. In this case, it shows it's off about 
know, two thirds maybe or one half. And then for a very long time, you are constructing and building a mine. It costs money, takes capital, labor, EPA, all the stuff we're all aware of. And then after we finally get it into production, then the stock price starts to come up and up. So I'm going to give you a real example of this curve and what I did with it and how I did well and I didn't do so well. Um, I had a company here called Mines Management. It was in Spokane. I knew the uh, people very well. I went to the uh, mine several times and I wrote about it. And we had it at under a dollar. <clears throat> and it was one of my early um, juniors. And it went up a tenfold. It went from under a dollar to 10. I put a stop in at eight. So if anyone got there at eight, they um, did well. And then I tried to catch this curve here. And even though it was back down, I forget, around two bucks or something, we bought it. And it did get bought out by Hecla, but I was wrong in timing. It's very difficult to time this production. So moving back up to the other one, basically the same thing. You just see that you get this big move, you get this trough, and then you get at this point. I was trying to pick this point at mines management. I failed. It did. It was down in here. It did get a little bit of money, but people got rewarded with Hecla stocks. It wasn't a real bad thing. Just some humor here that uh, real money still works. This gentleman is putting out burgers and fries for 50 cents if you pay it in real silver. I want to comment on the macro picture. We are going in either to an inflationary depression or a deflationary depression. Uh, a lot of us will call it a recession to be kind, but regardless, people ask me, well, I don't see this. And the reason being is that the authority figures, the po political class is very good at mitigating the problem. And they've given the U.S. and other nation states what we call EBT cards down here, which are just a plastic card like a debit card and you get your groceries off that. So you don't really see any soup lines or anything, but yet the amount of uh, people that are on the dole is quite significant. Remember when we get a depreciation in the currency, the silver denarius is an example, we see hard times and that's what we're coming to. So this is the final leg up. And I'm convinced with all the work I've done for my life that the metals are probably going to go into the historic record book as far as what they're capable of doing in terms of uh, where they're going to go. Now, I could be wrong. Certainly, uh, many of us have been more than patient, especially when it comes to our miners not performing. Uh, relative to the metal. I mean, gold's pushing up near the old high, roughly 2000. And the miners are back to I think, where they were in 2012. I just looked at it. I forget the number. But the idea being that miners are not performing normally to what you would see with that kind of a gold price. This is an idealized curve. And the, and the general idea is correct. The stealth phase of the gold market that would be hard to say, but I would say, obviously, at 252, when I started the first website, no one was interested in gold or silver. I mean, no one wanted to buy the bottom, and a few of us did, and obviously, we did well, and that was the stealth phase, so I could call that, and this is just conjecture, it's my opinion, but from the year 2000 to, say, 2003, and then 2003, it took off, and then you got into the first big sell-off, and you could call that 2011, where we got to $2,000 gold. Then this bear trap, which, you know, a lot of people think is going to, you know, it's coming back next year, and I'm certainly one of those. I thought that we would have a sell-off. I was on this trajectory and then discovered that uh, my two or three year uh, back and fill, meaning, you know, the $2,000 gold would drop off to pick a number, 1,800, 1,700. I didn't know. The market knows, and it was, I think, 1,150. So it dropped quite a bit. And then we get back up into this wild mania phase. And that's what we are approaching. Is that going to happen in 2023? No, but the base is being built. The base is being built because the gold um, run, the run to gold that I keep referring to has started. It's pretty provable if you read Incomerum's uh, new report. You'll see that. You also note that the uh, amount of bank purchases have succeeded uh, the amount in decades, and China, Russia, et cetera, continue to accumulate. So 
the base is set and all we need now is some media attention, some enthusiasm, public awareness, to get into greed, delusion, and a new paradigm. We're going on a gold standard. And that's ahead of us. And I don't think it's far off. I believe it's probably two or three years at the most. And the miners will participate. And the reason the miners will participate is that, first of all, metal could be, I'm not saying would be, but could be more difficult to obtain than any other time. The reason being is that now the metals markets are a global market. Back in the 1980 bull market, when I participated the first time, there really weren't that many people aware of how to buy metal outside the United States, maybe Canada somewhat. But this time with the internet, anyone anywhere is pretty much able to buy metal one way or another. And the reason the miners will go is that those that are worried about FOMO, fear of missing out, We'll look at the metals price and decide that, you know what, gold's 2,500 the ounce and silver's make up a number, $35 an ounce. And I really think that I've kind of missed the boat, but I also think that we're going into a new paradigm. I think that we're going higher. So I'm going to look for a mining company. And even with the sophistication of all the trading programs and vector vest and all these things and tools that people can use, to discover a true value, it's impossible to evaluate an exploration company, really, uh, until they make a discovery or have enough drill results. At that point, you can make a pretty good educated guess. The point being is people love cheap stocks, and there will be a lot of penny stocks. In fact, that will be one of the key features I will be looking for to determine the top of the market. It will be when I made the joke, but also wrote an article about all the miners have gone to pot. After the mining boom of the early 2000s to 2007, whatever, took place with the miners that burn out before the actual metal, which went to 2011, a lot of those companies that were miners became pot companies, marijuana companies. And that is an indicator that, you know, you're topping out. So I expect to see something similar this time around. But again, I don't think that that's often in the future. It's probably two, three years away. I want to put some context into how high could gold and silver go this time. Of course, no one knows, and we hear numbers, and you know it is what it is. And of course, the numbers, as I said, are somewhat disappointing, especially on the silver side at this juncture. But if you look at the gold-silver versus 50-year historical bubbles, this is by my friend Nick Laird in Australia. Look here near the top, um, you've got Rex Minerals, which is a 13,000% gain, Fannie Mae, nearly the same, Cisco 7,000. Gold was up, excuse me, silver's up 3,000% in the 1980 bull run. Gold was up 2,200% in the gold bull market of 1980. And what that shows, I'm, if you can see my cursor right here, it's pretty well outlined, it's in black and not in blue, that this is a kind of the middle of the bubble. Now, this time, this curve, this uh, chart is quite old. So when he did it, I'm not sure the year. So right now, silver's, gold's up about ninefold and silver's only up about fivefold. So it can reverse those. But regardless, what he's showing here, and I am elaborating on, is that we will see bigger moves ahead. And I think we could get, perhaps in these ranges again, I don't know. I do know we have a long way to the upside. And I also know this is the last phase. Just a reminder of an inflation adjusted price for silver. This goes back to the all time high in the year 1477. That was $800 silver in $1998, which would be greater than that now because the inflation is 1998. <laughs> but you get the idea that. They're at one time in world history, $800 silver per ounce. And you can see again from this curve that it's been clobbered really for a long time. And you know, extend my cursor here a little bit. You can see we're up in about 25 now, 22, 23, 24, which is very much at the bottom. And I mean, this whole area here is very low. And then we shot, shot up during the 1980 run up and then down to 473 in 1992, which is about where Buffett bought. So as a reminder, um, gold and silver have a place in every portfolio. Everyone that's a true investor should have gold and silver exposure. 
It could be with just the metal itself. I think it's better to have the metal and exposure to the leverage you get in the mining shares. And the way to play the mining shares is to stay with the top tier cash rich unhedged companies. I like the royalty companies the best at this juncture. Some of your bigger stalwarts have been beat up badly. Pan American, for example, um, they had uh, some issues as far as their mining costs. They're getting under control. It's going to be one of the best silver miners out there uh, in due time again, which it has been in the past. And then the mid tiers, we've got junior producers. But as this market continues to progress, you will want to move out of the top tier into the mid tier, into the junior producers and into the speculative stocks. But you want to be very, very careful because you don't want to make a huge gain in a major like a Franco Nevada and have a 200% you know, gain and then put all those into penny stocks. That would be foolish. So you want to mitigate that. And I'll get to that at the end. It's the last slide I have for you. <clears throat> Again, Incremarum just came out with their new report. This is from the last go. I don't expect that this curve has changed very much. What it indicates is that the uh, mine supply by country is flat. We really are not, you know, since the COVID thing in 2020, you see it came down quite a bit. It's popped up somewhat, but basically from 2014 or so, excuse me, <clears throat> it's been flat, which means more demand and not less supply, but no increase in supply. So that's price pressure. I show this in almost every lecture. It's uh, from Matt Watson. It shows the high demand case for silver. It shows with all mining and recycling about a billion ounces a year, this red line, that the amount of silver needed for all of the industrial demand, electronics, automotive, et cetera, is exceeded by the amount of mining supply. So that means we're in a deficit. In fact, the deficit is much greater than projected on this chart. In fact, Matt may redo it, I don't know. But um, the deficit here at uh, 2022 is showing us there's no deficit. We know from the Silver Institute, there was a 200 million ounce deficit. And a 200 million ounce deficit looks like this 2032 graph over here. This is 1.2, so 2030, let's say right there. That's what we actually had last year. So does that mean it's going up from there? Yes, it does. Uh, at least that's the projection. So silver is a, a lot going for it. Uh, <clears throat> this book is um, written by David Smith and myself. It's called Second Chance. Uh, the subtitle is how to make and keep big money from the coming gold and silver shockwave. And that is the key to this book. The main feature in this is there's several, but one is the ability to not get too greedy and learn to take a profit. Now, I understand that some of us are concerned that if we take a paper profit, that the paper may not be worth anything, but I really doubt that. I think that the perception will be that the US dollar is going to go to zero or get close to it. I truly believe there'll be a new financial system installed before the dollar is ever worthless or not being traded or not recognized or not used in transactions. So what the real issue is not taking the profit necessarily in paper. It's where do you put that profit? And that's the tough one. So do you put it into like treasuries, which you're guaranteed a loss? Do you put it into you know real estate? Do you put it into more mining stocks? Do you put it into physical metal? Do you buy a business? What do you do? And that I really can't answer for you, but this book does go through several scenarios that will uh, peak your thinking on what to do with the profits, where to put them, and how to play it. Now, I did say earlier that we have a ideology or a, a couple of ideas, I should say, about how to play the end of this. Uh, one technique called the sacrifice fly. This is where we use the derivatives markets to our advantage, like uh, an option on a penny stock. And we go through it in the book, and I have time to explain it, but I have gotten feedback on this book. I'm not saying it's true. I've actually had two or three people tell me verbally that this is the best investment book they've ever read. I'm not saying that it's of that caliber. What I am saying is designed for you, the people in the resource sector that maybe aren't sure of how to make a portfolio stand up to 
good times, bad times, and different times, and make money in the process, when to take a profit, when to walk away, and when to leave the sector. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Metals Investors Forum.